Welcome to Big Data and Machine Learning Magic with Node.js and Google Cloud. Um, a bit about us. My name is Sarah Robinson. I'm a developer advocate on the Google Cloud Platform team. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at srobtweets. I live in New York. It's my first time in Australia. Super excited to be here. Um, in addition to being a developer advocate, I'm also a Harry Potter advocate. Big fan of Harry Potter. If you want to chat with me about it after, I would love to. I'm also a big fan of Hamilton, the musical. Uh, I'm Brett McGowan. I'm also a developer advocate on Google Cloud Platform. Um, I'm less a Harry Potter fan, more of a Lord of the Rings fan. Uh, I'm actually going to New Zealand next week, so hopefully I'll check out the little Hobbiton tour and all that stuff. Should be fun. Um, I love Hamilton, um, but not as much as Sarah. We sit next to each other in the New York office, so mostly I just listen to Sarah talk about Hamilton all the time. Um, you can follow me on here on Twitter at, at @brettmcg. So as developer advocates, Sarah and I, uh, we work for Google Cloud. And Google Cloud, if you're not familiar, it's public cloud from Google. We've got all the normal compute stuff like virtual machines, platform as a service. Um, but we really have a lot of interesting things around machine learning and big data. So um, as part of our role, we'd love to hear what you guys are doing in whatever cloud you're running on, Google or not, see what kind of projects you're working on, and maybe how we can help. Um, we take that feedback back to our teams at Google to make our stuff better and, and help you solve your problems. So, um, oh, I should say, even though I live in New York City, I'm from Texas. All right, much better. How can you tell if someone's from Texas? They tell you. They will always tell you. Exactly. So uh, howdy, welcome. And let me turn it back over to Sarah. Thanks, Brett. Um, so I want to start out by talking about, at a high level, what is machine learning? Um, so essentially, machine learning is teaching computers to recognize patterns in the same way that our brains do. Um, so it's really easy for a child to identify the difference between a cat or a dog. But it's much, much more difficult to teach a computer to be able to do the same thing. So the idea is we write code that will find these patterns for us. And over time, these models will improve as we give them more and more data uh, through more experience. So here we have a diagram of a typical deep neural network. Um, this particular neural network is classifying an image as either an image of a cat or a dog. Uh, we can think of the input to this network as the individual pixels in the image. Um, and then each layer in the network is looking for a specific set of features in the image. Maybe it's um, the shape of the ears, the eyes, the nose. And the output, the final label, is going to be a prediction, whether it's a cat or a dog. In this case, the output is a dog. Um, but let's take a step back for a moment and pretend we didn't have any neural networks. And we were going to try to do some human-powered image detection on our own. Um, so if we were to write an algorithm to identify uh, pictures as either an apple or an orange, how might we do this without machine learning? So what are some of the things we might look for in our algorithm? You can shout it out. Color. Color is a good one. Um, so we could look at the color. And in this example, we could say, are the majority of the pixels in the image red? If so, it's an apple. Otherwise, it's an orange. So that would work really well for these two images. But what would happen if our images were grayscale? Then we might have to look for a different type of feature. What might we look for with these two images? Stem. stem. If there's a stem or not, we could look at the texture. Um, both good examples. So if we, if we looked for either of those, um, then we'd be able, able to handle the problem of potentially black and white images. But what if we got crazy and added a third fruit to our equation? If we added a mango, we'd have to start all over again. So you get the idea. Um, but all of these images are pretty similar. They're all circular. They're all fruits. Um, so image classification should be much easier if we have two images that look nothing alike. So if we have, for example, a picture of a dog and a picture of a mop should be really easy, right? The mop is not living or breathing. It has no eyes, nose, or ears. Um, should be pretty easy to distinguish between these two things. But it's actually not. It's actually pretty difficult. Um, so here we have four pictures of sheepdogs and four pictures of mops. Um, and it's kind of hard even for the human eye to be able to tell the difference between these two things. Um, so the idea here is that we don't want to write specific rules for each type of image we might encounter in our application. Because chances are we have to deal with more than just uh, animals and fruit images. We might have photos of everything. And in addition to photos, we might have other types of unstructured data that we're dealing with. We might have video, audio, and text. So what we want to talk about today um, is how we can help you make sense of this unstructured data through some machine learning products um, provided by Google Cloud. So on the left-hand side here, we have um, a few products to help you um, build and train your own custom machine learning models using your own data. 
So TensorFlow is an open source framework that lets you do this. And if you uh, want a place to run your TensorFlow models, run the training and inference, we have a product called Cloud Machine Learning Engine, um, which lets you run your TensorFlow models on managed Google infrastructure. What we're going to focus on today is the right-hand side, which I like to call friendly machine learning. And essentially, these give you access to pre-trained machine learning models as an easy-to-use REST API. Uh, so Google's been solving machine learning problems for many, many years. And what we're doing with these APIs is we're exposing some of these models to developers. Um, and today, we're going to tell you specifically how you can interact with these five APIs uh, using Node.js. So I'm going to hand it over to Brett to tell us about the Vision API. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so the Vision API is a uh, machine learning trained uh, API from Google. We have a nice Node.js wrapper um, called uh, Google Cloud slash Vision. So we've got NPM modules if you're using Node.js, but we also have these nice little client libraries for .NET, Python, Ruby, Java, Go, a whole suite of languages. So at the, at the end of the day, it's just an HTTP REST API, but if you want something that's a little more idiomatic and works well with your workflow, we have a bunch of client libraries for different languages to do things like uh, work with the Vision API. So let's talk a little bit about what it can do. It has, it has different kinds of detections it can do. So when you send it a photo, it can figure out different things about it. So the first thing it can do is label detection. So label this image. Tell me, what is this a photo of? So in this example, uh, it would say maybe cheetah. And it gives you some percentage of confidence. Like I'm 90% sure that this is a, is a cheetah. You know, maybe I'm 80% uh, sure there's a mammal of some kind. It kind of gives you a range of things it can identify, um, as well as a level of, of confidence about that. The second thing it can do is face detection. Now be aware this is not facial recognition. Right? This can't tell you who this person is. And it can't even tell you that this person in this photo is the same or different than another person in another photo. Literally all it is is seeing that there are faces. And we'll look a little bit more about that in a second. Um, OCR, so you give it a photo and it can find the words and the text in there and actually extract them out and give you information about that. Um, explicit content detection is pretty much what it sounds like, uh, finding things that are violent or maybe adult-themed uh, in your images. And this is actually surprisingly, or at least surprisingly to me, a really, really common thing that people do with the Vision API is the explicit content detection. So if at any point in your application, you maybe have users submitting images from the internet, so random internet users submitting photos, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so there's a couple of ways you could handle that traditionally, right? Is, you upload an image and you just immediately put it into some queue or some quarantine so that a human being looks at it and says like, all right, this photo is good, it's nothing too weird, let's post it. But then you don't get like real time social interaction. So um, a happy medium can be to run your image against the explicit content detection and just come, it comes back with a score. And if it's below a certain score, just go ahead and post it live. If it's above a, port, uh, a certain score, maybe block it or put it into some queue for a human to review. So you can get that kind of real time social um, responsiveness in your application. Landmark detection, you give it a photo and it can tell you, oh, this is a famous landmark around the world. I know what this is and I know where it is. Uh, and then logo detection, also kind of what it sounds like if can identify famous logos in, in photos. Um, so what are some real world examples of people who are using the Cloud Vision API? So uh, Disney came out with this movie called Pete's Dragon uh, and they wanted to promote it. So they created this game. So the name of the dragon in the movie is Elliot. And the way the game works is a scavenger hunt. So it gives you some clues. So it would say, oh, uh, Elliot the dragon, he's hiding behind the couch, or he's next to the lamp. So go find the picture of the lamp, or go find a picture of a couch, and you can reveal Elliot the dragon. So you would take your phone, you would go to the couch, you'd go to the lamp, you'd take a photo. Uh, it would run it through the Vision API and say, yes, this is a, a picture of a lamp, and it would overlay the dragon in your photo. So you sort of, you find Elliot the dragon as part of the experience. So very fun application um, using the Cloud Vision API to see if you actually were able to um, define one of these clues and show you the dragon. Realtor.com, uh, so these, this is a company that does uh, houses for buying and selling of houses, listings. Um, so say you're walking by or driving by a house that you're interested in. So there's a few things you can do. You know, you can like write down the URL that's on the sign. You can like write down the name of the agent. You can write down the address. Or using the Realtor app, you can actually just take a photo of the for sale sign. It uses the OCR, the text extraction. It actually reads the for sale sign that you took a photo of, searches the Realtor database, and then returns you the listing information. So much, much easier than like trying to scan a QR code or actually write things down. Uh, so these are a couple of real world applications of the Cloud Vision API. 
So let's talk a little bit more about face detection, not facial recognition, face detection. So it has identified three photos here. Uh, this is actually a photo of Sarah and myself and another colleague. We were in, um, in Petra in Jordan last year, uh, just kind of a fun little side break during a conference. And we were taking this like three person selfie um, to be ridiculous. And it has correctly identified that there are three faces. Um, I don't think it will recognize any of the camel faces yet, but maybe someday. Um, and it tells you some information about it. So first of all, it tells you where there are faces. So bounding box, um, give you some coordinates in the image. But then also, let's pick a, let's pick a, a face. I'll, I'll pick a totally random face from someone in this image. Maybe, I don't know, Sarah. And see some information about her. So it says headwear likelihood, like is she wearing a hat or headwear of some kind? Uh, very unlikely, it's because she's not. So I'm wearing one and, and our colleague Robert is wearing one. So that will return likely that we're wearing headwear. Uh, joy likelihood, very likely. It's vacation, there are camels you can pet, why not? Very, very likely to have joy. There's four emotions that we can detect. Uh, sorrow, surprise, anger, and joy. So you can kind of actually do sentiment analysis, right? Like if you have a photo of people interacting with your product or interacting with your service, you can programmatically see uh, people are really mad when they use your site, or they're really happy, hopefully. Um, but also you can identify different features of the face. So where are the eyes, where's the nose, chin, uh, different things like that. So landmark detection, you give it a, a photo of a famous landmark and it tells you what it is, right? So uh, here's a photo of the Eiffel Tower. You run it through the Cloud Vision API and it says Eiffel Tower, no. It says Paris Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. It's actually not the Eiffel Tower. Um, and the Cloud Vision API was not fooled. It was actually able to, det to detect that this is not the Eiffel Tower. So here's some of the JSON that is returned. Again, it gets a score 80, so it's like 80% confident that it's the Paris uh, Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. It also has like latitude and longitude, like where in the world literally is this thing? And also the first entry in the JSON response is called the MID. So this is an ID into the Google Knowledge Graph API. So um, as Google has been cataloging the world's information for search over the past many years, you know, it's, it's valuable to know that the, the text string Eiffel Tower is not literally just the letters E, I, F, F, E, L, right? Like Eiffel Tower is a thing, it's an entity, it's a landmark, it's a tourist attraction, um, it's a public building, it exists in Paris, like what is the Eiffel Tower, right? So this is a key into the Knowledge Graph API to actually get data back from Google, like what do we know about this entity? So if I were to feed it this MID, uh, it would actually tell me all that information and often a link to like the Wikipedia page to learn more if I want to know more about like what is this entity. So it, uh, it, does, this, it does this for a lot of things in the Vision API. Uh, a few more things besides just types of detection that it can do. So it has crop hints, so it can give you a suggested bounding box of like where is the most interesting feature of this, uh, sorry, within this photo, like where would you crop it to sort of zoom in. Um, web annotations, which I'll talk about in more details in a second. It basically, because we've cataloged a lot of images on the internet, we can sort of cross-reference the image that you have analyzed with our internet, um, with our, our internet catalog of images uh, to get more information. And then text annotations. So this is basically if you are, so in the example I showed is taking a picture of a street sign. It's just a few words, like no parking here. But what if you were to take a picture of like a menu or a, a page from a book? Something has like a lot of text. Uh, so this basically lets you do bulk text reading from just a photograph. So web annotations um, will, like I said, cross-reference your image with images from the internet. So this is a, a photo of a car. And what does web annotations come back? The first thing it comes back with is this, the make and the model, so Ford Anglia. And again, here's that MID I talked about. So if you wanted to know what the hell is a Ford Anglia, uh, you can actually get more information from the Knowledge Graph API. But it's a little bit more than just a Ford Anglia. You'll notice that it seems like a little bit more going on. There's like a portrait in the background. There's some like strings are holding it up. So it turns out it actually knows that this car is on display at the Art Science Museum in Singapore. So that's already a little bit more information than just what you could get like literally from the pixels in this image. And not only is it on display in the Art Science Museum in, in Singapore, it specifically is in the Harry Potter exhibit in the Art Science Museum in Singapore. And so actually references to Harry Potter, the literary series. So if you've seen the movie, you know that they basically steal this car to go fly to Hogwarts because they missed the train. Um, and you could actually, well, it won't tell you that much, but, um, but you, could, you could see that it's from the literary series. So 
literally more than just knowing that it is a car, but like what car and where, because it can cross reference this image with other images of things that it knows about um, on, the, on the internet. And if you want to know where did, you, where did we find similar images on the internet to get this cross reference information, it returns that data as well. So if it found your exact image somewhere on the internet, it will return this full matching image. And if it found a rough approximation of your image, you'll get, the, you'll get those URLs um, as well, both the URL of the actual like JPEG or whatever, or the page on which that image was found. So a kind of a, a sneaky usage of this API is, you know, we've all been to these like forums or whatever, you post an image and you check this box, is like, I certify that I have the rights to this image, this is mine. Uh, and I'm going to upload it, right? And everyone just checks, sure, even if it's not your image. Well, you actually could cross-reference that image using the Cloud Vision API and say, not so fast. Like, clearly, you just searched the Google image search to find a picture of this, because we found it on all these other pages, right? Like, you wanted to see, um, is the content that people are uploading, does it exist elsewhere? Is this really their image? Um, this might be a way to do that. All right, so that's conceptually what is the Cloud Vision API. Let's see a little bit of a code in a live demo. Um, so first, here's an architecture diagram of the Cloud Vision API in, in, in action. So I'm going to use something called Cloud Functions from Google Cloud Platform. So Cloud Functions are these like serverless little functions, basically these little Node.js, JavaScript functions that run automatically, serverlessly. You don't have to manage anything. You just give it the code. And these, these functions run in response to events that happen in the cloud. So in this case, it will respond to a file change event in cloud storage, which is basically how you save um, binary data or blob files, blob storage in Google Cloud. So we'll save a, a picture of this adorable koala. We'll automatically trigger a call to a cloud function, which will call out to the Cloud Vision API that we just talked about, get back all that analysis data, save it as a JSON, uh, as a JSON blob, and then put it in, say, like a gist into GitHub. Now, normally what you might do in a, like a non-serverless world is if you want to do some additional processing, like maybe create a thumbnail of this, that would just be the next step in the code. But in sort of a, a functions as a serverless, serverless functions as a service, comma serverless, comma microservices, comma buzzword world, uh, we actually could have another service that does that separately, right? So we just have another cloud function totally independent from the first one because it's not a chain. It doesn't need to know anything about the Vision API. And it separately, of the same trigger, uh, will run and do a resize and maybe make like a tiny thumbnail. Or one thing that you see a lot of is you basically pre-render images for different media formats. So I have a big image and I want to scale a tiny one down for a thumbnail, maybe a smaller one for a uh, phone version, a medium one for a tablet or desktop, and so forth. Whoops, so what does that code look like? So here's my function um, called analyze image. And I won't like dig super deep into it, but just at a high level. So a cloud function has an event parameter. And the event, this basically uh, generally looks the same for any kind of cloud event. But within it is something called event.data. And that has properties specific to this type of event. So in this case, is a file change event in Google Cloud Storage. So we're going to create a reference to the image uh, using this data.media link. And then we're going to call the Cloud Vision API that we just talked about. So You'll notice that this is actually all the code. There's no service accounts. There's no API keys. There's no OAuth. Um, that is because by default, most of the code that you run in Google, in Google Cloud Platform runs auto-authenticated to make other API calls within Google Cloud. So this is really nice because if you're moving some code from, say, development environment to staging environment to production environment, uh, you don't have to actually manage and ship a lot of these API keys and tokens. Uh, you will automatically be authenticated to the project and the environment that you're running in. So um, it makes that a lot easier. I mean, you can supply, if you have special credentials, you can. Um, but by default, it's auto-authenticated to call Google Cloud APIs. Uh, so we run some analysis, get a response back, write it to the GitHub, GitHub gist. There's a little bit too much code to put on the slide, so you can use your imagination. Um, actually, we, we have it posted on GitHub, and there's a, a link at the end. So let's actually see this in action. All right, so this is our Google Cloud Storage um, file listing. It, there are no objects in this bucket because there's nothing. So let's upload a picture of an adorable koala. But it's actually going to be a specific photo. Um, I was stalking Sarah's Instagram earlier, and she went to Lone Pine's uh, Koala Sanctuary in Brisbane and got this. So I may have, may have stolen this photo off her Instagram, so sorry, Sarah. 
when, when you say, hey, go ahead and set up your demo on my laptop, um, be careful because who knows what other things I will do. Um, so we're going to upload this Koala, and it's going to automatically trigger those two cloud functions, one to do the resize, and then one to do the Cloud Vision API analysis. And so if we tab over here, we can see, what is it, um, 440. All right, here we go. So probably this line. Function execution started, downloaded file. So you can see extracted labels, mammal, fauna, fauna marsupial, koala, object, object. That is my favorite kind of animal. Uh, and then also, where is thumbnail? Created koala thumb. So you can see our two cloud functions running. So let's, oops, let's go back and see. Did we create a thumbnail? Maybe? Aha, yeah. So there's a super tiny version that it created. And then we should have a gist, GitHub gist link. Let me grab this. Uh-oh, is that the whole thing? I don't, that's, <laughs> yes, got it. Um, you can tell this is live because it's not working. How do we zoom into it? Yeah, maybe. Hold on. I just have to like, it copied the whole log line. That's fine. It's always very exciting to watch someone edit text. Boom. All right. So here is the gist they created, saved it to GitHub with that same mammal, fauna, fauna marsupial, koala, wildlife data. So super cool. So that is the Cloud Vision API. So I will hand it back to Sarah to talk about, whoops. Just kidding. Uh, before you put this in your application, you actually can play with the Cloud Vision API just in your browser, right? Just on your desktop, upload an image, drag and drop, see what the Vision API has to say. So if you have, you're thinking about maybe using the Cloud Vision API, but you don't want to actually like write a prototype app, you can actually literally just in from your browser, drag and drop some images. It'll give you the JSON uh, response and it'll visually give you response that the API, uh, what kind of analysis it does. So you can see like, is this is a good fit or not for whatever use case maybe you're thinking of. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering, going back to that dog and mop example, how good is the Cloud Vision API at telling the difference between a dog and a mop or a broom? So we fed all eight of these to the Cloud Vision API. Uh, for the dog, 99% confident that it's a dog. Uh, and in fact, even the common door is 77% uh, confident about the specific breed. I don't know what a dog-like mammal is, um, but it's 76% confident. I don't remember learning about, about that one in school. Dingoes. Yeah, I, maybe a dingo is a dog-like mammal as well. Uh, we'll see. We could, if we have time afterwards, we'll try it. Uh, so it got a dog right. It got this right. We said if it came back with broom or mop, like we'll give it credit for. So we ran it on all eight, and here's how it did. From the dogs, three out of four, it got dog or it got the breed specifically. Um, this one, it got fur, which even looking at it from my own eyes, like what in the world is that thing? Uh, I'll grade on a curve. We'll give it credit for that one. Uh, as far as the, the mops and the brooms at the bottom, one of them, that one, it got textile rather than identifying it. So I don't know if we can be that generous with our grading. But still, seven out of eight for a test that is intentionally designed to be misleading um, is, I think, pretty decent. So... Now I'll hand it back over to Sarah to talk about the natural language API. Thanks, Brett. Um, so now we're gonna switch gears and talk about text analysis. Um, with the natural language API, uh, we also have a handy Google Cloud node module. Um, if you wanna use the, nat the natural language API in your node application, just npm install at Google Cloud slash language. Um, and what the natural language API allows you to do um, is to get a better understanding of your text. You can, do, you can extract entities, sentiment and syntax from text that you pass to the natural language API. I'm going to dive into uh, each of these methods and then we'll see a live demo. So first I'll talk about the entity extraction endpoint. Um, I'm a big Harry Potter fan as I mentioned before so I just took this sentence from Wikipedia about JK Rowling and wanted to see what the entity analysis endpoint would return. So I pass it to the API. It returned these five entities. Um, and we can look more closely and see what types of JSON responses we got back for each of these. So what's interesting here um, is that the first three entities are actually all pointing to the same thing. They're just different ways of referring to J.K. Rowling. Uh, Robert Galbraith is a pen name she used for a different book series, but I won't get into details on that. Um, so it was able, the API was able to normalize these, identify that they were all referring to the same reference. Um, so in the JSON, we get back the name of the entity, the type, which is person, and then we get some additional metadata. So we get the MID, which Brett spoke about before, which was an ID that maps to JK Rowling in Google's Knowledge Graph. 
Um, and then we get the Wikipedia URL for the Wikipedia page about her. So these all point to the same one. Uh, for British, we get that it's a location. Uh, we get the Wikipedia URL for the United Kingdom page. So if this had instead said United Kingdom born novelist, uh, it would have pointed to the same entity. And then um, we get a similar response for Harry Potter. And if you have entities in your text that don't map to a Wikipedia page, you still get an entity response back. Um, it just has an empty metadata object. So if it had my name in here, Sarah Robinson, it would find it as an entity. Um, it just wouldn't have a Wikipedia page, because I don't have one yet, maybe one day. So that's uh, entity analysis. The next thing you can do with the Natural Language API is analyze sentiment from your text. Um, so if we had this, which is what you might see as a restaurant review, the food was terrible, I would definitely not recommend this restaurant. So if you worked at this restaurant, chances are you'd probably want to flag this review and maybe follow up with the customer. Um, but you probably don't want to read all the reviews. Maybe you only want to find the most positive and the most negative ones and then take some sort of action on those, um, follow up about the experience. So what you can do with the sentiment analysis endpoint is you get two values back. You get score, which will tell you how positive or negative is this text, um, ranging from negative one to one. So for this, we get negative 0.9 is almost fully negative. And then we also get magnitude, which tells us regardless of being positive or negative, how strong is the sentiment in this text. And this is going to be ranged from zero to infinity, normalized based on the length of the text. Um, so in this example, this text is relatively short. It's just a sentence. Um, so we get 0.9 relatively small number. So that's sentiment analysis. And the next thing you can do with the Natural Language API is get a bit more into the linguistic details of the text. So if we take this sentence as an example, the Natural Language API helps us understand text. We get a couple of things back. And this visualization just shows us um, the JSON we get back, uh, what it looks like. So the first thing we get back is a dependency parse tree, which basically tells us how the words in the sentence relate to each other which words depend on other words. Um, JSON will give you details on how each word relates to other words in a sentence. Then we get the parse label, which is the role of each word in the sentence. Um, so helps is the root verb. API is nominal subject. The period at the end is punctuation. Um, details on what each word is doing in the sentence. Then we get part of speech, which is, is it a noun, a verb, pronoun, or adjective? Um, we also get the lemma which is the canonical form of the word. So here we just have one lemma for helps. We get help. Um, and this is useful if you're counting how many times a particular word is used to describe something in your application. Um, you probably don't want to count helps and help as two separate things. You probably just want to count them as, as one thing. And you can use the lemma, the canonical form, to do that. So like if this had instead said understands, we would also get a lemma back for that as understand. And then finally, we get additional morphology details for each token in the sentence. Um, and this is going to differ based on which language your text is in that you send to the API. Um, a few weeks ago, we announced some new features for the Natural Language API. Um, so when it first launched, it supported English, Spanish, and Japanese. Um, and we now support a couple more languages. And another thing we added was um, entity-based sentiment. So instead of returning just one sentiment value for your entire document, it can now tell you the sentiment around specific entities. I'll show you that in a moment. And then uh, we're continually improving the models behind uh, the sentiment and uh, entity analysis on the API. Um, so I'm going to go to a brief demo. If I look at, um, let's see, the Natural Language API product page, you can actually try it out in the browser and generate a visualization like we saw before. So what I just want to show here is the entity-based sentiment. So if I am writing a restaurant review and I say um, I like the sushi, but the service was terrible. We're going to see what the Natural Language API has to say about that. So we can see here that we get sentiment for each entity. Um, so here the entire document sentiment probably wouldn't be as useful to us. But here we can see that sushi returned a score of 0.9 on a range of negative 1 to 1. Um, and service returned a score of negative 0.9. So super useful granular information there. Um, we also get the full document sentiment. Again, in this case, the entity-based sentiment is much more useful. And we get that visualization, um, which I showed you in the previous slide. Um, so we'll share the link to this page at the end. You can generate your own visualizations on text that you pass the API. 
Uh, I want to talk about a company that's using the Natural Language API in production. Um, this company is called Wootrick, and they are a customer feedback platform. So what they allow their customers to do is gather feedback as their customers' users are moving through different pages in their application. And Wootrick's uh, job is to help their customers make sense of this feedback. So if you've ever seen a form like the one on the top right here, where you're on a website and it says, on a scale of 0 to 10, how is your experience on a specific page? So you give it a numbered score, um, and then it might ask you for open-ended feedback. So it's pretty easy for Wootrick to make sense of this numbered score, obviously, from 0 to 10. Um, but what's much more difficult is to make sense of this open-ended feedback that you're getting. And they're actually using each of the natural language API methods to make sense of this feedback. Um, so they use sentiment analysis to just gauge, did the numbered score they gave line up with their feedback? So maybe they gave a 10, but then they were actually complaining about something so that they can normalize that. Um, and then they're using entity and syntax analysis to extract um, the topics of each piece of feedback um, and see how people are talking about um, that specific thing. So maybe they have a high priority customer who is angry about usability. Instead of having to read the entire piece of feedback, they can then route um, that in near real time to the right person to address it. So just an example of a company using this in the real world. Um, next, I wanted to show a demo highlighting the syntax analysis feature of the API. And the way the demo works is I wrote a node script that calls the Twitter streaming API. Um, and what this does is it lets you stream tweets based on a particular search term. So in this case, I'm looking at all the tweets about with Australia in them. Now, the streaming API doesn't give you all the tweets in the fire hose. Uh, it just gives you a subset of them. So we're going to grab a subset of tweets about Australia. And then I took the text of each tweet, ran this for a couple of days, sent it to the Natural Language API. Um, the Natural Language API gives us a JSON response back. And then what I do with that JSON response is I store it in a BigQuery table. Um, BigQuery is a big data as a service tool that we offer on Google Cloud Platform. Um, it's fully managed, lets you query lots and lots of data really fast. So I add that into our BigQuery table, and then we can do some analysis um, on this Twitter data. So if I go over here to the browser, um, here we can see um, a subset of what the data in my table looks like. So I've got the ID of the tweet, uh, when it was created, the hashtags in the tweet, which is returned from the Twitter API. Um, and then I get this giant JSON string, which is the response from the Natural Language API. Um, this is the BigQuery web UI, so you can use it to inspect data in your table. You can also write queries directly in the browser. Um, you can use the BigQuery REST API to write queries as well, but in this example, we'll show you in the browser. So you might be wondering, if I'm writing a SQL query, how am I going to parse this giant string? Um, and the answer is BigQuery has a feature called user-defined functions, which lets you write custom JavaScript functions that you can run um, on columns in your table. So if we hop on over here, um, I have written a function that is going to um, look at the most common adjectives used um, on Twitter to describe Australia in the past couple days. I just ran the script for a couple days. Um, so what's really crazy here is it's running this custom JavaScript function on all the tweets in my table. Um, when it's done running, I'll look at exactly how many tweets I'm running this on. Um, so essentially what we're doing here is we're taking um, each token. So the Natural Language API returns a token um, for each uh, word in our text. And um, it tells us the part of speech. So we're just looking at the part of speech tag. Um, is it an adjective? If so, we'll count it. Um, seems to be taking a bit of time while it's running. Let's look at some details for this table. So it's running this over uh, 148,000 tweets. And uh, this is the schema of my table. So I'm getting the ID of the tweet, uh, the text when it was created, um, the hashtags, which you saw, the tokens, which is just that string return from the Natural Language API, um, and then the score and magnitude from sentiment analysis. Um, usually it doesn't take this long, but live demos, you never know. So I'm going to hop on over here to my next query and uh, run that. So what this is going to do is we'll see which query finishes first. It will be race. This one is going to look at the emojis in my tweets, because so I love emojis. Um, I want to see which emojis people are using on Twitter when they talk about Australia. Um, so this is just looking at the particular character code that makes up an emoji to see if 
the token is an emoji, and then we're just going to do a running count of those. Um, this one is still running. Usually it doesn't take that long, so I'm going to uh, look in my query history here and see if I already have a version of this. Let's see. Hold on one second. Hmm. All right. Well, that doesn't appear to be working. This one is still running, too. All right, live demos, you never know. Um, all right, I'm going to keep these running, and we can pop back to them at the end, see how they do. Um, so let me just check this one. Yeah, it's still running. Maybe it's a Wi-Fi issue. I'm not sure. Um, OK. Couldn't find that other one. All right, I'm going to hop back to the slides. And if that worked, you'd be able to see uh, the most common adjectives people are using on Twitter, along with the most common emojis. Um, just to show you an example of what you could do, so this is, oops, this is what the output would look like uh, if we counted the emojis. This, I ran this one on a different data set. Um, and then I created an emoji tag cloud just to see um, an, a way to visualize which emojis people were using most often to um, talk about a specific topic. Just another example of how you could visualize the data. Um, so now that we talked about natural language, I'm going to hand it back over to Brett to talk about the speech API. All right, thanks, Sarah. So this is speech API. This is basically spoken speech into text. And again, uh, as Google, we've been training these machine learning models over years and years on things like, OK, Google. Oh, no one. Usually I get at least someone's phone to go off with OK, Google. But anyway, what's that? But I have a very like universally common. No, at least <laughs> so you you optionally yeah. So that's actually that's actually one thing. That's all right. <laughs> um, so now you can actually personalize it to your voice. But if you don't, then it's just a generic voice model. Um, so I usually get someone with that. So anyway, if you want that functionality where you can say OK Google, and as your user is speaking, it can be like transcribing their spoken word into text. Um, that is what the Cloud Speech API can let you do. So it supports over 80 languages. Actually, as of two days ago, no longer is it 80 languages. It is now over 110 languages. So you all, y'all are probably the first people. Woohoo! Yes, um, y'all are probably the first people actually to hear in person um, about this release. So we're very, very excited. We've added um, over over 30 more languages to uh, to our speech API. So if anyone speaks a weird, obscure languages language, I may ask for volunteers in a second. Like well. <laughs> We're not there yet. Australian's too weird. That's, it's, it's indecipherable, even by machines. Um, so another thing that we added the other day is uh, time offsets. So this basically, when you give it an audio uh, file, it will turn it into text. So the famous Abraham Lincoln speech, four score and 20 years ago. Um, it can actually, it'll transcribe the whole phrase, the whole text, but it also will give you timestamps for individual words. So for example, the word four, it will say it is between 1.3 and 1.4 seconds. That's like the snippet of audio where that specific word exists in your audio stream. So really, really useful for doing like extractions of uh, where, where in this giant audio file um, does this particular word uh, come out. And that, that also is brand new. We just released that. So a customer that's using this in real life. So Azar basically is a, a chat app uh, where I can talk into my app. Um, but I can talk to other people in other countries who maybe don't speak the same language that I do. So it basically dovetails the speech API with the Google Translation API so that I can speak in my language. It turns it into text, translates it into the other person's native language so, so they read what I'm saying in their language. And when they speak back, it comes to me in my language. So really, really cool sort of opening up these opportunities for um, these awkward selfie conversations around the world. So very, very cool. So uh, I'm going to show a demo <coughs> where I'm going to basically create an audio file. Uh, we're going to use a, a tool called Sox um, that's basically just a command line utility that records audio input from my laptop. Um, create a JSON request, send it via HTTP post to the API, and then we'll take a look at the response. So I'm going to do it literally just using curl and command line. But again, there's a nice Node.js wrapper for this, uh, as well as .NET, Python, Ruby, and all that good stuff. So, ooh, that's exciting. I don't think. Love a good, I, I think, running. are we sure? I think this might be a Wi Fi issue because this should not take that long. What's happening here? It probably takes about 15 to 20 seconds. Yeah, I'm just going to refresh this. 
Oh, oh wah, wah, wah. Hey, who's staying at Hilton? Can we have your access code? <laughs> you switch to NBC. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So the BigQuery counter is client side. So he was disconnected to the internet. It's just going to run forever and ever. But don't worry. It's not going to bill you for that. Um, all right. Well, we'll come back to that. Let's see. Did this work? Let's go to my favorite website. All right, looks like it's working. There's always something weird and political in there, so hopefully that didn't, uh, nothing weird came up. Uh, all right, so I created this command line script. So I can say something, and it will turn it into speech. So, hello, Sydney. Hope everyone is still awake today. All right, so here is the JSON request that we're about to spend, send to the API. Um, so here's some data about the actual audio file itself, its sample rate, its encoding type, the language, so English, US. Um, speech context, so this is basically phrase hints. So the Cloud Speech API is trained, it's a general purpose machine, learned, machine learning trained model, which means it's designed for just general use. Well, in your specific applications or in your business, you probably have certain terms that just aren't in common. You like technical terms or like you know weird product names or whatever that, that we just don't know about. So what you can do is you can actually su supply us phrases, words as part of the transcription request. So we know uh, there's like these terms that we don't really know about, but we can now use it to to take a best guess that maybe I'm saying something um, that the Cloud Speech API might not normally know about. Uh, Max alternative. So this is. It'll give you like a main, it's best guess, but then you can request, hey, but also give me one or two or three or four, maybe like alternate transcriptions uh, that, that maybe I can inspect visually or manually to see if it's a better uh, transcription. And then here we're actually embedding the audio file in the request itself. So we're doing a base64 encode, putting it in the JSON. But if you had, say, like a bunch of audio files that you wanted to transcribe, you could actually upload them to, say, like Google Cloud Storage, and then actually just send the, like a link there and say, transcode this file. So you don't have to actually embed it in the request itself. So if you want to do like a big batch uh, transcription of audio. So let's send it. And assuming we're not still on the Hilton guest Wi-Fi login. Oh, here we go. So. Hello, Sydney. Hope everyone is still awake today. Are we? All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Well, I am 97.6% confident that we're still awake, which is a coincidence, because that's how confident it was that it correctly transcribed um, my audio. So that's English. As you imagine, this product is developed in Silicon Valley in the States. So my American accent, is, it did pretty good. So who here speaks like a different language that maybe we can try and see how good it is? Um, all right, you want, let's, let's see if we have the language code. Where is this thing? Where am I? All right. Um, are we in alphabetical order here? Um, oh, how do we spell it? P-A-S. Ah, uh, nope. So I also don't think this language code thing has been updated since we added new languages. Strike one. Someone got another one? Persia. All right, here we go. All right, do so you want to volunteer to come up and speak that? So I'm going to use FA as the language code. Anything you want. Please don't swear. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you stand here, and then it's just the, it's the mic of the, of the laptop. So whenever you're ready. You could think of something particularly hilarious. No, just kidding. Uh, so just hit enter when you're ready, and it will run for it will record for five seconds. However much okay. you want to say. Yeah. No. Yeah, you can hit it. All right. So let's see. It's going to churn on that, and we will probably need you to verify if it was even close. Is this even close? No. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Thanks to the power of the translation API. Um, I will translate to English this phrase and see what did it come back with? Sweaty head. <laughs> That's what you said, right? Yeah. <laughs> As I said, we released this two days ago, so maybe there are some um, bugs, but, uh, but thank you for volunteering. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, for unrelated reasons, Sweaty Head was actually my nickname in high school, but <laughs> probably I shouldn't explain why. Just kidding. <laughs> what did you actually say? I think you are handsome, Matt. Oh, thank you. 
I, so, that was the Google Truth API injecting itself and, and correcting your statement. So, <laughs> but thanks. All right, and now I will um, turn it back over to Sarah for the Video Intelligence API. Thanks, Brett. Um, so the Video Intelligence API is our newest machine learning API. And uh, as with the other APIs, we have a node module that you can use to interact with it. Um, so you can just run npm install at Google Cloud slash video dash intelligence. Um, and what the video API does is it lets you understand your videos in the same way that Brett described, that the Vision API lets you understand photos. This lets you do that sort of analysis at the video level. So you can understand your videos, uh, entities at shot frame or high level, video level. So the best way to demonstrate this is through a demo. And uh, I'm going to hop on over here and make this a little bit smaller. Um, so here's our demo. This is a video of a Super Bowl commercial for Google Home. And I'm going to play just the first couple of seconds of the video. So we've got a lot of scenes in this video. It starts with a mountain pass. Then we have a street scene, um, a dog, a garage. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Uh, but the idea here is that there's a lot of different scenes changing. A lot is happening in the video. Um, and if we were to manually analyze this, we would have to watch the whole thing, write down what was happening in every scene, and then maybe store that in a database somewhere. Um, the video API actually does all of this for us. So all we need to do is send it our video. It returns us back um, JSON response with details on exactly what is happening in every scene. And then in addition to that granular analysis, it'll tell us at a high level, what is this video about? Um, so maybe we have a video with costumes and candy. It'll tell us it's a video about Halloween. So it does some analysis, aggregate analysis, on all of the uh, detailed scene level data that we get back. So what I have here below the video is um, basically just a visualization of the JSON that we get back. So it tells us that it's, there's a dog in the video, and it knows exactly when that dog appears. Um, it tells us there's a cake at the end. Um, if we scroll down, we can see some more data. It tells us even what breed of dog that was. And uh, if we look here, it also identifies that mountain pass from the beginning scene, which is pretty cool. So this is what it can do with one video. Um, but if you're using the video API, chances are you have lots and lots of videos um, that you want to analyze. So if we go here to the home page of my app, I've got lots of videos here. Um, let's say, for example, that I work at a media company, and I've got petabytes of videos sitting in storage buckets. Uh, let's say, specifically, it's a sports media company, and I've got tons of hours of sports footage. And what I want to do is create a highlight reel. So something you might want to do if you have a lot of media is find all the clips specifically of one thing, maybe baseball. So I want to find all my baseball videos and compile them into maybe like a minute long highlight reel. So with the JSON data that we get back on each video, it makes it really easy to implement search across our entire video library. Um, so if I search baseball here, let me refresh that, um, it tells us not only which videos have baseball, but it tells us exactly where we can find the baseball scenes in those videos. Um, so this one, this video is almost entirely about baseball. This is my favorite example here because um, this video, every year Google publishes a year in search video highlighting top searches from that year. Um, so lots of different things happening in this video. There's only one moment where there's a baseball clip in the video. And if your job was to find that clip, there's a chance you might even miss it if you're watching this video. It's only like a two second clip. You might skip over it accidentally. Uh, but the video API is able to pinpoint that clip directly. So if we go to it here, uh, we can see indeed there is a baseball clip in this video. This is from last year when the Cubs won the World Series. I'm from Chicago, so I was pretty excited about that, making the year in search results. Um, so that's what the video API can do. Um, we'll do one more search. So it's winter in Australia right now, although to me this is a very mild winter, living in New York. Um, but I think we can agree it'd be nice to be on a beach right now. So machine learning cannot take us to a beach, but it can show us all our beach videos, which is the next best thing, right? So I'm going to search for all my beach videos. And even if the video um, is not of, you know, entirely about a beach, we can find just those small clips where we find a beach in our video. So here we can skip to those, find all of our beach scenes across our videos. We'll show one more. Um, so this demo just kind of shows you um, how the video API is kind of transforming how you analyze videos. So something that even just a couple of months or years ago would have taken hours with the video API, it just takes seconds or minutes to transcribe. Before I jump back to the slides, uh, I want to revisit these demos. 
Okay, it finally finished. It was a Wi-Fi issue. Thanks, Brett. Um, so here we can see the adjectives um, from that Twitter analysis that I ran. And oh, we, we didn't refresh this one, so it's still running, but I'm going to refresh that. And let's see. Uh, I'm going to search my queries. I think it was project query. There we go. All right. This is the correct emoji query. Hopefully it won't take 900 seconds. I won't make you wait that long. <laughs> uh, but we'll give it just a couple seconds to run. Again, this was using the natural language API to find our most used emojis. There we go. Um, so maybe there was some sort of big musical event happening. People were using the musical note emoji. Um, these are the most common emojis used. So. Back to the video API. Uh, that was the demo of the video API, and I wanted to talk momentarily about the architecture of the demo app. Um, so how it works is all of the video files are being stored in a Google Cloud Storage bucket, which you saw earlier with Brett's uh, Cloud Functions demo. And I've got a Cloud Function listening on that bucket, so that's triggered whenever a new file is added to the bucket. It will check, is it a video file? If it is, it sends it to the Video Intelligence API for processing. And one thing you can pass in your video API request is the URL of another cloud storage file where you want to write the annotation JSON when it's done processing. You don't have to do that. You could take some sort of action once it's done. Um, but in this example, I'm just having it, when it's done, write to a cloud storage bucket. So I've got the videos in one storage bucket and then the video metadata in a separate storage bucket. Uh, and then the front end is a Node.js app that's running on Google App Engine. App Engine is our platform as a service product on Google Cloud. Um, so the front end of the app doesn't actually directly call the video API. All it does is it grabs the, um, associate, the videos, and then it grabs their associated metadata, and it implements a search functionality across that JSON. Uh, so I built it with another developer, Alex Wolf. If you liked it, give us a shout out on Twitter. Um, and then just a, a look at what the uh, JSON looks like for label detection. Here's a video that has a bird's eye view scene in it. And indeed, label detection is able to identify that there's a bird's eye view. Um, and what we get here is a segment object. So this tells us in microseconds what was the start and end time that this particular thing, in this case a bird's eye view, appeared in our video. If it appeared more than once, we'd get multiple segment objects. Um, it also gives us a confidence score. How confident is it um, that it correctly identified this label? So in addition to label detection, um, I don't have a, a JSON snippet for it, but it can also do shot change detection, which means um, show me all the times that the scene, like the camera moved to a different scene in the video. So it'll just give you um, the timestamps of all the times the scenes changed. So that was the video API. So we just gave you an overview um, of five different machine learning APIs on Google Cloud. Uh, but we've got one more thing. In our talk title, we promised big data. So we wanted to end with some big data analysis specifically related to JavaScript and Node. Um, and to do that, we're going to use um, this BigQuery table. And we have a, big, a public BigQuery table that contains all the public code on GitHub. It's a giant table. Um, it's over two terabytes, and it's updated frequently. Um, this is just a visualization to show the breakdown of co public code on GitHub. We look at it by bytes. We can see that C accounts for 63% of code um, by repositories. JavaScript accounts for the most with 14% of total repositories being JavaScript repos. Um, so there's all sorts of interesting analysis we can do on this, on this GitHub table. And the first thing I want to do is find all the JavaScript files on GitHub. Um, so I'm going to hop back to the browser. And we've got another BigQuery tab here. And just to show you what the table looks like, um, there's a couple different tables uh, that have this data. So we have the contents table which contains the contents of every single file in the head branch on GitHub. And this table is the biggest one. It's over two terabytes. And preview of what it looks like. Uh, here's what a row in the table looks like. And these files are empty, but if I skip ahead, we can find some files that contain text. Um, so that's what this table looks like. And you can easily join that with the files table to do uh, more analysis. We're going to query the files table in this query example. So this table is a little bit smaller, um, has the file path of every file in the head branch on GitHub along with some other metadata. So here we're going to count 
how many JavaScript files there are in GitHub, and while it runs, does anybody want to guess how many they think there are? All of GitHub. Oh, nobody guessed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the answer is over 300 million, which is pretty crazy. That is a lot of JavaScript files on GitHub. Um, that's a relatively simple query. Um, so the next thing I wanted to look at was, um, can we do any sort of analysis on what the most popular node modules are based on this data? Um, so if you're a Node.js developer, you know that the way you define your dependencies is with a package.json file. And using um, BigQuery's user-defined functions, which I talked about previously, it's pretty easy for us to um, write a JavaScript function to parse the package.json. We just need to look at the dependencies object and then count the different dependencies within that block. Um, so if I go over here, we have um, a query already written to look at all of the package.json files on GitHub. Um, now, I'm not going to run the full two terabyte query here, because I wouldn't want to make you wait for however many seconds it would take to run. Um, so I've cheated a little bit, and I've extracted all the package.json files into a table, so it doesn't need to do the full scan. Um, it's already got the package.json file. So this query is only going to process almost seven gigabytes instead of two terabytes. Um, so I'm going to run it here. And what's really cool about these user-defined functions is that it's doing this complex string parsing. Um, and it's running this on every single package.json file on GitHub, which is kind of crazy. So if I look here at the table that I'm, this is the table I extracted with all the package.json files. There are 2.7 million of them. Um, and it's running this custom function on all of those files, um, which is kind of crazy and something that previously would have taken a lot of time and resources to do. While that's running, oh, well, I was going to ask if anyone had guesses. Any other guesses on most, most common node modules? Before Pat we, Lander. Which one? Pat I don't know that one. All right, let's see if that's in the top. Uh, Express is the number one. Lodash, debug. I don't see Google Cloud Vision in here, but <laughs> you never know. Um, so these are some of the most, most common ones. I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with these. Um, so if we go back to the slides. Um, so this is what the full query would look like if we just have this nested select to grab all the package.json files on GitHub. Um, and just to show you that we actually did run that query, but we didn't want to make you wait for it to finish processing. Um, it took 238 seconds, which is actually really, really fast considering it was going to process 2.2 terabytes of data. So we ran that earlier today. We have a screenshot to prove it. So that's all we have. I um, encourage you to try out all the machine learning APIs and the products we talked about. Um, Brett talked about the in-browser demo for the Vision API. We have a browser demo for all five of these APIs. So before you write any code, you can hop on over to the browser, um, try out these APIs, see what the response actually looks like. Um, and we have the code for all the demos we showed in the talk. Uh, in various GitHub repos. So definitely encourage you to check it out. We'll leave that up for a moment. If you have any questions, I'm on Twitter at, at sweatyhead. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm changing it now. Maybe just hash. I'll only respond to hashtag sweatyhead. <laughs> Maybe it'll be trending. Yeah, it'll be trending on Twitter. People are like, what? <laughs> What's happening in Sydney? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.